Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about psychological aspects of uh, breast self examination um, and just give you <coughs> an overview of the talk. Um, I'm actually going to talk about uh, two different uh, kinds of self knowledge. Firstly, self knowledge about risk status um, and looking at uh, perceptions of risk and, and how they are played out in models of health behavior, talking about some applications of these models to the prediction of uh, breast self-examination, and considering the impact of knowledge of family history of uh, breast cancer and also genetic risk information, how that plays out in terms of uh, breast self-examination. Uh, then the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk about uh, self-knowledge around risk behavior, um, and particularly the link between alcohol and uh, breast cancer, and to what extent knowledge about the riskiness of one's behavior impacts on uh, behavior and techniques to, to overcome any negative effects of that. Okay, so the first uh, part of the talk, focusing on self-knowledge of risk status, um, I want to consider the role of risk perceptions in models of health behavior, and, and particularly looking at whether perceptions of risk uh, are related to uh, breast self-examination, and whether they're particularly important for with, uh, among women uh, with a family history of breast cancer and whether knowledge of one's risk status, in, uh, in particularly in relation to genetic testing, uh, whether that impacts on risk perceptions and uh, breast self-examination. So, uh, as mentioned earlier, there's uh, many different models of, of health behaviour. One that's been applied a, a lot, one of the earliest ones, is the health belief model, um, which gives a a central role to uh, perceived vulnerability or perceived susceptibility or perceived res risk, I'll use these terms uh, interchangeably. Um, so the health belief model kind of outlines, outlines four key variables. The first one around threat appraisals. So one's perception of being uh, at risk or vulnerable to a condition or to an illness. And secondly, one's uh, perception of the seriousness or perceived severity. So what are my chances I'm going to develop this disease and how serious would it be uh, if I were to develop this disease? Then the uh, second part of the model is about the behaviours that one can engage uh, into, um, in, in reaction to the, that threat. So how do I kind of manage that threat? Uh, what kind of things can I do? So, for example, in relation to the threat of breast cancer, then breast self-examination is one behaviour um, that women can engage in to try and cope with that threat. Um, and there's two uh, key perceptions that are, that are important in relation to the behaviour. It's first, the, the perceived benefits of the behaviour. Um, will this you know, help me detect uh, the early signs of breast cancer? Um, and then the perceived barriers, are there... Uh, barriers that might prevent me doing this. So this could be in relation to self-efficacy, it could be in relation to time, it could be in relation to negative emotions. Um, so are there, so what are the barriers, um, what are the benefits? And according to the model, that if you perceive yourself to be uh, vulnerable to a serious uh, health threat, um, then that should motivate you to en engage in some health protective behaviour. And the behaviour you choose will depend on those, the behaviours you choose will be those that have many benefits and few barriers. Then, all uh, with, within the health belief model, uh, there's a fifth box which is cues to action. So, uh, this kind of process has to have a cue to action. So, it could be, um, you know, detection of a symptom, um, or it could be reading an article in the newspaper, watching a television programme. So, there could be some internal or some external cue that, that then. Uh, leads you to think about perceptions of uh, th threat perceptions and also uh, coping uh, behaviours. Now, this is kind of one example of a model. There are other models, uh, for example, like protection motivation theory, that also have perceptions of vulnerability and severity as kind of key components uh, within within the model. So, what's the evidence that risk perceptions? Uh, are important in terms of driving people's behavior. So there's a couple of meta-analyses that have been conducted 
looking at the health belief model, an early one in 92 and a more recent one in 2010. And these are average correlations across um, many different studies, looking at the average correlations of people's, say, perceptions of susceptibility, severity, and benefits and barriers. Uh, and to what extent are these related to health behaviors? So these are across different health behaviors. And the main thing to, I want to uh, point out here is if I make a distinction between these threat appraisals, severity um, and susceptibility, and coping uh, appraisals about actions you might take, then these threat perceptions um, have weaker correlations with, with health protective behavior than do the coping appraisals. So what seems to be driving people's behavior uh, more is, is their beliefs about the, the behavior. So does it have benefits? Uh, will it lead to positive outcomes? And uh, are there barriers or perceived barriers uh, that might get in the way of uh, performing these behaviors? Whereas their perceptions of risks and, and, and uh, severity are less important uh, determinants of their behavior. So looking at this uh, in relation to uh, breast self-examination, there's been kind of many studies, so I'm just going to pull out a few, but the results are, are pretty consistent. So these are two studies, an, er an early study by, uh, by Champion and a more recent one, again looking at the correlation between uh, perceptions of susceptibility and severity and perceived benefits and perceived barriers with the performance, the frequency uh, of performance of breast self-examination. And again, you see a similar pattern of results that you tend to get um, stronger correlations uh, in relation to the coping appraisals than you do with the threat appraisals. Uh, a couple other studies uh, comparing uh, women who, who do or don't uh, perform uh, breast self-examination. Um, again, a similar pattern of results that um, you get significant results, uh, significant differences or, or larger differences um, for, for the perceived benefits and barriers than you do, than you do for perceptions of um, susceptibility and severity. So there's a a general um, kind of trend here, both looking at health behavior generally, but also specifically in relation to breast self-examination, that perceptions of risk, uh, perceptions of severity, uh, seem to be less important in terms of driving people's behavior than their beliefs about the behavior itself. So uh, a couple of uh, additional studies I want to highlight. So, so first is a study that I was involved in, um, where we're looking at, uh, specifically looking at women with uh, a family history of uh, breast cancer. So women who've got a first, deg uh, first degree relative with breast cancer are 2.3 times more likely to develop the disease. Um, so in this uh, study, we were just focusing particularly on, on uh, a sample of, uh, of women with a family history of uh, breast cancer. Um, compared with other s uh, studies, we use a prospective design, so we, were, so we had a nine-month follow-up, uh, and we made a, a distinction between uh, what we termed infrequent, appropriate, and excessive breast self-examination, because there's some ev evidence that engaging in excessive breast uh, self-examination might be counterproductive. Uh, and there's also uh, evidence that, um, particularly if, uh, for women who've got a family history of uh, breast cancer, this may be related understand to be related to uh, breast cancer worries, but this may also inhibit the uh, appropriate uh, performance of uh, breast self-examination. So, so in this study, we've uh, just kind of shifted over. <laughs> we split this uh, sample into three groups. So appropriate, um, where women uh, reported engaging in breast self-examination one or two times a month. Um, infrequent, less than once a month, and excessive, uh, more than twice a month. So uh, a few things to point out here. Firstly, that uh, the majority of women uh, performed uh, breast self-examination at an appropriate uh, level, but there's uh, quite a high percentage who, who are engaging in breast self-examination relatively infrequently, despite having a family history of uh, 
uh, breast cancer, and, uh, and a smaller number, but still a, a large number of women who, who are engaging in excessive uh, breast self-examination. So we're interested in, in the, the variables that dis distinguish between um, these three different levels of uh, breast self-examination. So to, to highlight, again, you'll see, um, so I've got the F values here with the significance levels. And here you'll see, again, that uh, perceptions of susceptibility um, didn't distinguish between these three groups. Uh, perceptions of severity did, but, but uh, at quite a sort of, uh, low level, the significance, whereas the beliefs about the benefits, the barriers, and breast cancer worries um, were variables that were really important in terms of discriminating between these um, three groups of women. So the, if, if I look at, um, actually look at infrequent uh, breast self examination to start with, so the ones I've highlighted in red, these, these are where the differences are uh, significantly different. So these means are significantly different from... Uh, appropriate uh, breast self-examination group. So you'll see that um, women who, who engaged in breast self-examination relatively infrequently um, had lower perceived benefits of engaging in breast self-examination. Um, they had greater uh, perception of emotional bar barriers, uh, usually focusing about worrying about um, breast cancer, and also um, had saw kind of self-efficacy worries as being a significant barrier as well. Interestingly, if we look at uh, the, uh, what we call the excessive uh, breast self-examination group, um, they were more likely to uh, see the breast self-examination as being, uh, having many benefits, um, also had, saw self-efficacy as being less of a barrier, uh, but interestingly, had more breast cancer worries. So for, for this group, what seemed to be driving uh, their behavior was worries about having uh, breast cancer, which is leaving, leading to more frequent or over-frequent uh, breast self-examination. OK, uh, so so the so point to, to, to draw out from here, there was even, even amongst a, uh, a group of women with a fan, family history of uh, breast cancer, the perceptions of susceptibility still aren't that important or don't appear to be that important. Uh, whereas obviously worry um, and also kind of self-efficacy about engaging in the behavior more important. A uh, more recent study which, uh, which I've come across uh, looking at uh, genetic testing um, and whether this has an impact on breast, breast self-examination. So this is when you're given very clear information about whether you're a carrier or, or non-carrier of, um, of a gene that uh, predisposes you to, to developing breast cancer. So, for example, the cumulative risk of in uh, BRAC1 carriers of developing breast cancer by age of 70 is 65%, and, B, and in uh, BRAC2 carriers is 45%. This is com compared with the population uh, risk of around about 12%. So a massively increased uh, risk if you're, if you're a car carrier of one of these genes. So uh, in this particular study, it was women with family history uh, of breast cancer, and they went for, who were going for genetic testing, uh, and they were given the test result, they were either a, a carrier or a non-carrier of one of these genes. Um, they assessed uh, breast, breast self-examination -exam prior to testing and again 12 months later after testing. Um, they also measured some psychological uh, variables. So in terms of the question, does knowledge about carrier status have an impact on uh, engaging in breast self-examination? Now what they find, found here is that in both uh, groups, so, peop so women who were uh, we're told they are a carrier of one of these genes and, and non-carriers. Actually, in both these groups, um, the proportion of women who engaged in breast self-examination increased from baseline tw 12 months follow-up. Um, there is actually no difference between the groups in terms of the increase. Okay. Um, if anything, it seems to be higher, uh, more marked increase in the non-carriers, but that interaction is non-significant. So in both carriers and non-carriers, 
um, over those 12 months, breast self-examination um, is increasing. They were expecting that uh, carriers might, you'd get a greater increase in carriers than non-carriers, but both increased. <coughs> um, they also looked at, uh, unfortunately, they didn't report whether uh, perceptions of risk changed uh, from baseline uh, to follow-up. But what they did look at was the predictors of uh, breast self-examination at 12 months follow-up um, using a whole range uh, of variables. Now, uh, what they found was that, it's true of most studies, that past behavior is a strong predictor of future behavior. So uh, amongst the carriers and the non-carriers, whether um, the women engaged in breast self-examination or not at baseline was, the, was a strong predictor of whether they did it follow up. Um, also for both groups, response efficacy. So the perceived benefits of, in, of uh, engaging in breast self-examination examination was again a uh, significant predictor uh, for those, both these groups. But then what was interesting was looking at um, variables that were different for the two groups. So amongst carriers, of, um, they found that depression was related to uh, breast self-examination. It was a negative relationship. Whereas in non-carriers, uh, it was a positive relationship. So the more anxious the women were, the more likely they were to engage in breast self-examination. And interestingly, coming out is perceived risk. So the more they felt they were at risk, then uh, the more likely they were to engage in breast self-examination, which to me would suggest that actually having gone through genetic testing, being told um, that they were non-carriers, was perhaps not reassuring. Okay? And there was kind of residual anxiety and uh, perceptions of risk um, that are, are driving uh, their behavior. Okay, so hopefully in the first part of the, uh, the uh, presentation, I'm going to show you that uh, risk perceptions in general, they're, they're, they're a central uh, component of many models of health behavior. But when you look at uh, the evidence across health behavior and also specifically in relation to breast self-examination, the correlations are quite weak and they're weaker th than they are for other uh, perceptions around perceived benefits and barriers of the behavior. Second part, uh, one is kind of switch, so it's related, but uh, talking about self-knowledge of risk behavior. So there's many things that we do that put ourselves at risk of developing um, serious health conditions in the future. Now the question is, um, if we, given that information um, about our our behavior, the riskiness of our behavior, is that sufficient to change behavior? Um, and if it is, or if it isn't, are there things we can do that can enhance the impact of risk information on uh, behavior change? So if we look generally across uh, the literature, find that interventions that focus on risk perceptions are not very good at changing behavior. So. It's a meta-analysis done by uh, Sheeran et al. in uh, 2014, uh, where they looked at interventions that successfully changed, changed threat uh, appraisals. So this was both risk perceptions and also perceptions of severity. And then they went on to look at uh, what was the effect of these interventions on subsequent behavior. And what they found was that interventions um, could change threat appraisals, uh, you'd around about so the D of 0.05 is a medium effect size, but then if you look at the effect on subsequent behavior, you get a smaller effect. So it was a, a D of 0 0.023. So it's possible to change threat appraisals, but they don't then translate into equivalent changes in behavior. So why might this be? There's, there's various explanations, but uh, one key explanation is that if we're given uh, risk information, that people often react to that by engaging in defensive uh, processing of that information. Um, and I'll give you the reason why that might be in a moment. So to give you an example of that, um, this was a study by Leffenwall. Um, this was done with student drinkers, where they were giving them information about the, the risks of drinking. Um, and then they asked people to rate how important the problem was 
so how important the problem is kind of heavy, excessive alcohol use, and also got people to, to the students to rate um, the, the, the kind of the scientific quality of the or the persuasiveness of the of the messages they were given. And they looked at people's responses. Uh, there's four groups of uh, drinkers or non-drinkers, so non-users non or non-drinkers. Uh, uh, secondly, people who, uh, who drank alcohol but didn't engage in binge drinking, people who engaged in, engaged in binge drinking occasionally, and people who engaged in binge drinking frequently. Um, and what, what you find <coughs> is in terms of problem importance that it's you know, a linear trend down. So the, the heaviest drinker rate the problem as being less important than the non-drinkers. And similarly, in terms of the quality of the, uh, the argument or the scientific robustness of the, of the messages, again, a similar trend whereby the heavy drinkers are much more critical of the messages than are the non-drinkers. So it's quite clear evidence. Uh, it's, it's true of, of drinking, but you see it across other health be behaviours, health risk behaviours, where people who are engaging in defensive processing of the message. Okay. So, uh, why does this hap happen? Um, one idea behind this, put forward by uh, by Still in self -aff affirmation theory, is that not only um, to health messages about the the, in the riskiness of our behaviour threaten our physical in integrity, as it's telling us that we if we carry on with this behaviour, we're going to we're going to encounter. Um, some, some negative ha health outcomes in the future, but also attacks our self-integrity, so our sense of being a rational, adaptive, uh, adaptive and morally ad adequate. So the idea being is why would you engage in these risk behaviours, in these behaviours, if it's going to lead to these negative outcomes in the future? Okay, It's not a rational thing to do. So not only does it threaten our physical integrity, because it's outlying future physical health risks, but also our self-integrity, uh, because as a kind of adaptive, rational, morally adequate person, we shouldn't do this. So how do people um, kind of deal with that? Well, one way of dealing with that is by resisting the health message, by derogating them or counter-arguing counter them. So people engage in defensive uh, processing to um, kind of protect their self-integrity. Now, one way of overcoming this, uh, according to self-affirmation theory, is by reflecting on uh, one's cherished values, actions, or attributes in an unrelated domain, in a domain not relevant to the threat. So it, if, if I'm given uh, a message about the riskiness of my behavior and the, how this might lead to future health risks, but uh, I'm also self-affirmed by thinking about my positive attributes in an unrelated domain, the idea that this protects my, or bolsters or protects my self-integrity, uh, so I'm more open to take on board the, the health message. So I feel more secure about my self-integrity, uh, and I can therefore engage in more open-minded or more balanced processing of the health message. And if I do that, then I should be more likely to accept the health message and therefore make changes in my cognitions or intentions and my subsequent health behaviour. So if I can bolster my sense of self-integrity, uh, either before or after uh, receiving a, a message about the riskiness of my behaviour, I'm protecting my self-integrity so I can therefore take on um, the information about the risk behaviour and not derogate it, not dismiss it. So that should then lead to changes uh, in, in cognitions, intentions and behaviour. So as evidence that this is a technique that works, so even uh, quite, and I'll give you an example of a technique in a moment, this is a technique that can work. Uh, so again, a meta-analysis looking at effects on uh, message derogation, uh, intention and behavior, significant effects on these uh, three outcomes, small effects, um, but, the, but the, the interventions are quite uh, brief and quite small. Uh, but they enable people to be more open um, and more likely to have positive intentions and behaviour change. 
So, give you an example of a, a study that's uh, looked at this uh, that's relevant to, uh, to breast cancer risk. So, this is highlighting the risk, uh, so, so, sorry, the link between alcohol and the risk of developing breast cancer. So, women who drink more than 45 grams of alcohol per day, which is approximately three drinks, have a 1.5 times the risk of developing breast cancer than non drinkers. And it's a kind of linear trend. So, for every 10 grams of drink, which is slightly less than a drink uh, c consumed per day, the risk of breast cancer increases by between 7 or 12 percent. So the, the question here is, can engaging in self-affirmation uh, increase the acceptance of this risk information? So uh, a study conducted by Harrison Napper looking at this, so this was with female undergraduates who were high-risk drinkers, so they drank over the uh, recommended a uh, number of units of alcohol per week. Um, half the uh, women were uh, randomized to the self-affirmation uh, manipulation. And this was a, a values essay. So this is simply uh, where you're given uh, a list of, uh, of values and asked to pick the one that's most important to you and then write an essay, a, a short essay, a paragraph about why that value is important to you. Okay. And the idea is by doing this, uh, is a way of self-affirming what's important to you in a domain that's not being attacked. Okay. Um, and they compared this versus a control. They had a, a, a con controlled condition where people talked, I think, about why their least important value might be important for somebody else. Okay. Um, the uh, students were then given a leaflet that highlighted this link between alcohol and breast cancer. And this was then followed by measures of perceived risk, intention, um, and alcohol consumption at follow-up. So, to show you the results. So, this is um, comparing uh, perceptions of risk in the, in the, self, uh, the self affirmed uh, condition versus the non uh, affirmed condition. And there was a, these differences are all significant. So, immediately post reading the, uh, the messages, then at one week follow up and one month follow up. Um, so this, these differences are significant at each uh, time point. So engaging in this self-affirmation uh, task um, led to uh, the women having higher risk perceptions, which, which is what the, uh, uh, was one of the, me the main messages of the information they were given. In terms of uh, intention to reduce, so this was just measured uh, immediately post the receiving the message. So the self-affirmed group had significantly stronger intentions to reduce their alcohol consumption than those in the non-affirmed uh, condition. So as interesting just to point out, so in the non-affirmed condition, so they're given the information about uh, the link between alcohol and breast cancer, but, but essentially one is the, is, the, is the lowest score you can get on this. So a very low mean there. Does that translate into behavior? Well, uh, in this study, no, it didn't. So this is looking at alcohol consumption uh, from baseline to one month, uh, sorry, that should be one week, to one month follow-up. Um, you know, these lines are parallel, no increase or decrease at all. So um, despite um, increasing risk perceptions, despite um, promoting an intention to cut down on alcohol consumption, this then didn't translate uh, into behavior. Now, one of the reasons for this, looking at a, another model of health behavior, is, that, uh, is the idea that there are multiple phases to, to health behavior. So, um, so risk, perception is, is quite, uh, risk perception is quite early in this process in terms of getting people you know, sort of motivated to think about actions they could take, um, and they, particularly in relation, uh, in addition to outcome expectancies and uh, perceptions of self-efficacy, uh, are going to lead to intentions, so intentions, for example, to cut down on alcohol consumption. But then to translate that into uh, behavior, other um, kind of processes are important, and particularly around uh, the making of action plans and what's known as action control. So it's often not sufficient just to have a strong intention to do something. One then 
also needs to make plans to ensure that intelligence is translated into uh, behavior. So there's a lot of research around the making of uh, implementation intentions or if-then plans. So if people make very specific plans about the situations in which they're going to change their behavior and how they're going to change behavior, then that's more likely to uh, result in change behavior. And then there's various uh, techniques that people engage in, for example, like self-monitoring, uh, to ensure just that, that those behaviors, those changes in behavior are maintained um, o over time. Okay, so just to, um, a few conclusions. So in relation to uh, people's uh, perceptions of their risk uh, in terms of, kind of negative health outcomes in the future, generally they're weak predictors of health behavior and also weak predictors of uh, breast self-examination. Um, some evidence that uh, family history or genetic uh, testing can increase uh, breast cancer worries, um, and this may lead to overperformance of uh, uh, breast self-examination. Um, think about the processing of risk information. There's evidence to suggest that we generally um, engage in negative or sorry, de uh, defensive processing of risk information, and this may impede attempts to change behavior. So simply informing people about the risks uh, are unlikely to change behavior. But there are techniques, for example, like self-affirmation that can be used to bolster or, or protect self-integrity that then can uh, facilitate acceptance of this risk information, which then may lead on to changes in intentions and also in behavior. So thank you very much. It's very patient of you. Um, I wanted to ask um, to say two things, please. One was, um, what is the evidence for the actual efficacy, rather than perceived efficacy, of best breast self-examination? Because I thought we weren't really advocating yeah, it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And the other question related to that was about, you were asking about frequency, but in my previous clinical practice, it's the technique of breast self-examination that's Absolutely. the most important thing. Yeah. Um, okay, two, uh, in relation to your first question, so the, the studies... Uh, the first study I talked about was a time when breast self-examination was uh, recommended and I'm aware there's been a, a huge debate about whether it should be or, or, or not. Um, and, uh, and you correct me if I'm wrong, um, it's about being breast aware now, is that still the case? Yeah, which... Sorry, people are still saying breast aware rather than... So, like, I qualified 30 years ago and we were advocating that telling women how, how they could do breast self-examination. That's not to be done anymore. It's not, we're not rec advocating it now. So okay. It was always technique rather than frequency yeah. was the big issue. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, so, so in relation to the first question, so at the time when we do the studies, it, it, was, uh, it was recommended. In, in relation to the, 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 the most recent study, that it was a French study where it's neither, um, I think in the, it's not particularly, it's neither recommended nor discouraged in France, as, as, as I said. Um, in relation to the second point, you're absolutely right. It's not just frequency, it's also technique. Um, and that's something that most studies don't as, as, um, assess. And this might be a particularly uh, a problem, uh, but people suggest it's a particular problem for when um, you have very frequent uh, breast self-examination, that it might be quite cursory um, kind of examinations and, and you're absolutely right, it's about technique, not necessarily frequency. And that's something that you know, most studies don't look at. The problem isn't that they're being too cursory, it's that they're busy poking away. And the breast is the glandular tissue. If you poke yeah. enough, you're going to feel little things in there. That's what your breast is. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. 
So I was going to ask you about, so I'll say something about, so maybe your points about your self-affirmation theory, well, these were some of the answers to overconfident doctors. Should we come <laughs> to that? Yes. But actually, you then had your lack of evidence on actual behavior, so maybe not. Well, yeah. So, um, okay, two answers. In relation, so the example I gave was in relation to breast self-examination, but the models and the ideas would be most likely true. So talking earlier about um, you know, skin self-examination. So it'd be very, you know, the, the, the variables would be very similar. So it's kind of an example of, of the, of the behaviour of behavior and, and how risk perceptions might uh, relate to that. Um, and just a second question has gone up in my mind. You know, you were talking about um, self-affirmation, and I was kind of thinking, well, maybe maybe this is appropriate, to, applicable to these all these overconfident doctors. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. There is certainly low. You know, that's what part you have to do in your annual appraisals, and you're supposed to be reflecting, and you're supposed to be getting. Well, you, you have to at least every five years get a 360 degree stuff from all of your colleagues, yes. saying what you're like, and blah 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 blah. All those yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. So the so the idea is that it, it allows you. Um, when you're in a threatening uh, situation, it is one way of dealing with that threat, which then allows you to open up to you know, possible criticism or possible um, feedback. Um, in the study I showed, there was no, just remember your first question, there was no uh, evidence that it impacted on behaviour, but there's other studies which, which show that it, that it does. Um, so uh, in general, across studies, there is a small effect on, 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 on behaviour. So it does seem, it does seem to be a, pro a promising um, kind of technique um, for, for allowing people to be more open to risk information or criticism, anything that's a, a threat to the self. And that, that would, would equally apply to, to the doctors, as you were saying. So, uh, if I'm understanding correctly, the self affirmation technique helps people to um, take on the, the information Correct. that they are at Correct. risk. But in, in this particular study, it didn't particularly change their behavior that was relevant to, Correct. to their outcome. Um, and maybe it does in other cases, but are there other techniques to get people to change their behavior? Oh, absolutely, it's, yeah. I mean, it's very really interesting because it's yeah. related to what yeah. other people say. Even yeah. if you perceive your situation, that doesn't mean that That's right. you can um, help yourself. Two aspects to, to uh, the answer to your question. One is that there's different phases of health behavior. <coughs> so, so, for example, in the trans-theoretical model, they, are, they identify five different phases going from pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, maintenance. Um, other models make a distinction between uh, a motivational phase where you're talking about uh, people's um, motivations or increasing people's motivations to change the behavior, and a, volitional, a volitional phase or a post-intentional phase of once people have made a decision how do they translate that into to behavior? And also it might be a maintenance phase as well. So once you've made a change, how do you then maintain it? Now the variables that are important in each of those phases and the techniques that are important to change those variables are gonna be different for each phase. So if, if you're dealing with motivating people, then telling them about the risks, their risk perception, you know, you know, uh, giving them risk information might be the important, important first step in terms of motivating people to be wanting to change. And self-affirmation might be an important way of ensuring that people are open to that information. Once people have made that, that decision, okay, I want to make a change, then there's a different set of um, techniques which are around kind of planning or self-monitoring um, that allow you to, so particularly around planning, that allow you to make those first steps. Of, okay, I want to, for example, cut down on my drinking. How am I going to do this? In which situations? So can I identify the situations? Can I make uh, plans of what I'm going to do in those situations? And then once I've initiated those, those changes, then I can, I'm more in a maintenance phase where I might engage, for example, in self-monitoring mm -hmm. to ensure that I'm actually keeping on track. In, in terms of um, the behavior change techniques that are available, so uh, Susan Mickey's got a taxonomy of uh, behavior, cha cha behavior change techniques, and it's 93 different techniques mm. that you can use. Um, some are more, obviously, some are going to be more effective um, than others, and some of them are going to be more effective at different times in that kind of, kind of behaviour change, uh, different phases or stages of behaviour change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for the phase from knowing that you have a problem to doing something about it, um, is, you mentioned planning as yes. one. 
Uh, are there other techniques, or is that the uh, commitment? Ma uh, com making a strong commitment, um, social support, getting support from others. Um, I mean, th there will be there will be a, a lot. I mean, most uh, most research I'm aware of has been around planning because that that fits in quite yeah that fits in well with the models of of, of health behaviour. But there 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 will be other techniques as well. I was wondering. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if uh, the study that you were talking about with the self-breast examination and the individuals in the study had like a first relative. Yes, that, correct. So I was just wondering if, when you're looking at their perceptions and kind of gauging how they perceive like their vulnerability and severity yeah. and stuff whether there is a difference between those individuals who would have been carers for their first relative or those ah, who would have question. just been observant, like observe their first relative, um, if that was covered in the study. Yeah, and if you think it would have made a difference between those individuals who fell into the excessive um, self-examiners. Yeah. yeah, very good question. I, I don't know the answer. Um, I would have... I've, would have the data to look at that. Um, I don't know the answer. Um, you, you, that would be a reason. That would be a reasonable hypothesis that you would expect the, the closer the, the contact you've had with, particularly say, caring, um, for, you know, for a mother or a sister, um, then that would have a more of an impact and make you more kind of concerned about your risk um, than if than if it was if you were slightly more removed. That that would make sense, but. Um, I, uh, I don't. I'm pr we definitely didn't look at that. Um, I'm, not sh I'm not sure where we would have measured caring state. I'm not. I'm not aware of the answer to that. But this was a very recent study. Sorry. Thank you very much. There's a very recent study on self perception of carer status. This is okay. just um, people caring for their elderly parents. And uh, which I think makes it really clear that there's no clear dichotomy between caring, not caring. And self-perception of ca be being a carer is not necessarily what social services would count as being a carer at all. Okay. Uh, um, let alone what a, I don't know, a nursing home might count as being a carer. So I think that's a very difficult question to, uh, to ask and get anything useful out on it. Mm. Well, I was just really wondering because we were talking about the other studies that showed that Perception of risk didn't necessarily alter yeah. behavior. Yeah. So I was wondering, like, if it was the case that if you were caring for the individual who had cancer and your perception of risk increased, then it would seem an odd kind of conclusion that you're... So it seems yeah. like you'd have kind of different answers. So yeah. Uh, it, it, most likely a distinction between... Um, Mechanism where, which I could go through is in terms of worry, uh, which, is, which, is, which is more of an emotional response than a cognitive response about your risk. Um, because you could be, you know, you might perceive yourself as being at very high risk but not be worried about that because, you know, you, know, you go for checkups, you, you, know, you self examine, and, and so on. So, um, in relation to the example you gave, that it, 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 if it does have an impact on, on behaviour, my, my guess it would be through worries or through an emotional route than through a cognitive route. That makes more sense. I was just going to say there's loads of smoking children of of people who've got lung cancer, that's a much more directly obvious link than alcohol and breast cancer. And people just continue smoking. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Because, because uh, I think people engage in defensive processing in terms of um, you know, um, either dismissing the evidence or just thinking it's not gonna happen to me. Um, the, the, the 
yeah, that people will have um, ways of, of, of dealing with that, that information. So I just wanted to ask about the broader implications of some of these studies, because it seems like common sense tells us that once you make people aware of the risks, they're going to change their behaviour. And we've put a hell of a lot of emphasis on this in public policy. So I was just wondering whether all of these pictures of diseased lungs on cigarette packets and, you know, terrifying ads about drunk driving, um, are they effective? Or has anybody studied it? And do the results bear out in the same way as these studies? I think, um, in, rela I think in relation to, to, to smoking and, and, and lung cancer, that... that um, I, think, I think there's a, I'm most likely partly guilty of it in relation to the talk, of saying that risk perceptions aren't important because I think they are, or risk information is important. Because if you look at um, smoking levels over the last you know, 50 years or so, they've gone down. And the reason they've gone down is people now realise it causes lung cancer. Whereas, you know, 70 years ago, people didn't know that. So, so risk information is important. Or is um, it because the taxes have gone up? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's helped, but um, the people are aware of it being a, a risk behaviour in a way that they didn't 70 years ago. Um, so in that respect, yeah. Um, but by the same token, I think you know, we have... Risk information can be a, a threat. And... And we, you know, there's biases that we do engage in where we want to push away. That and there's also biases in the way we, we interpret information that's given to us. I might be able to say more on that. Well, just to, just, just to pick up on, what, on your question, uh, it, it seems to me that, that, I mean, if you're just thinking very crudely in terms of philosophy of, of action, so there's a kind of you know, very simple model of action where uh, action is the result of both uh, belief, what you believe, and what you want. Uh, um, so there's the cognitive side of action, and then there's the sort of affective side of action. Um, and the implication of that seems to be that, that, that actually, in many of these cases, merely changing what people believe isn't in itself going to be enough to change what they do, unless you also plug into, as it were, the affective side um, of, their, of, 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 their, of, of their minds. And, and, um, I mean, I think we normally take for granted people don't want lung cancer. Yeah, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, so, so it's not, so, so this, by, by effective, one would need to mean more than just you don't want lung cancer, but uh, and thinking of something, as it were, more emotional than that. Um, yeah. I mean, if you think about, you know, the way that, the way that you know, um, propaganda works or the way that, you know, politicians make their pitch, I mean, it's, it's only partly a matter of presenting, presenting rational arguments. I mean, there's, you know, the appeal to emotion is such a, such a powerful, kind of such a powerful thing. Uh, and and it, it could be that in some of these cases, uh, merely presenting people with risk information might not be sufficient in the absence of some other kind of, um, some other kind of appeal. I mean, isn't, uh, adding emotion to that doesn't seem to be enough either because precisely what um, Fiona and Judith were talking about, the, the logistics of implementation, yes. the difficulty yes. of that could be. This is a really yeah. interesting conversation because um, it's not just our health information that tends to rely on knowledge and outcomes. Um, our guidelines in health do exactly the same. Lots of analysis of our guidelines and we're only accepting those or applying them half of the time. Um, there's been about 30 to 40 systematic reviews looking at strategies to change our implementation behaviour and the outcome of all of those is some things work sometimes in some circumstances for some people and there are no magic bullets and the um, recent evidence suggests that what we need to do is tailor our strategy according to what's determining our behaviour or what's likely to be influencing our behaviour but it's um, a really really interesting um, field it's, it's we've got a long way to go I think. <coughs> I mean, that was one of the key points that you know, I took from your presentation earlier, is that to, to, to be able to change a behaviour, you need to understand why it's happening and what's determining it, uh, and particularly in relation to the barriers, and say something like smoking, that obviously knowledge of, of, of lung cancer is only one 
one factor that plays into that is also it's a very enjoyable thing to do. It's got lots of reinforcement. Um, you know, so you have to you have to understand the, the whole the whole behaviour and and just having the information may not be enough. If there's other important drivers, you know, you know uh, that 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 are, that are that are driving the behaviour or maybe barriers to change. Mm -hmm. um, I, I actually had a question about um, self-affirmation. Oh. If I could, if I could ask that. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, could you just say a little bit more about these value essays yeah. that people were asked to yeah. write? So, what was yeah. the what were they asked to write about exactly? Um, so, typically, what 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 um, well they're given they're given a list of I think it's. It's like six or eight values, so it'd be things like, um, you know, relationships, uh, family, might be politics, religion. Um, so, so you're asked to pick out what's the most important one to you, and then write write an essay. I think giving is usually giving at least three reasons of why this is important to you. So the idea is that you're you're affirming that value, which is a core core aspect of yourself. So. Um, so it's a, it's a way of you, you know, it's expressing your. So the idea is expressing your core values is, or reflecting on your core values is self-affirming. So this is just a mechanism to, to get yeah. you, well, a very brief mechanism to, to, to get you to do this. So I, I just wanted to ask why they didn't go for something more, more direct. I mean, rather than, I mean, ask them to, to reflect on their strengths, for example. That, um, well, that would also would work. Yeah. That would also that, work, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I'm reflecting on my values. I mean, I might reflect on... You know, the importance to me of loyalty, or something like yeah. that. But I might, it might also, <laughs> it might also cause in me the recognition that I haven't been a very loyal friend to right. those people. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, uh, it just seems a rather indirect form of right. self-affirmation, simply asking people to reflect on their. It seems to work. I mean, values. yeah. I mean, there are other ones where they, um, you can get people to reflect on their strengths as well. Yeah. So it's, it's like, I think it's values, attributes, or strengths. Right. So, right. you know, yeah. and it's the same. You know, it's the same principle, yeah. kind of behind it. And did it make a difference what values people? Ah, uh, no. Very few studies look at that. Um, I, I, I've done it in one study with alcohol, and it does make a difference. Uh -huh. um, so if people uh, affirm um, social relationships, it actually get a counterproductive, um, get a boomerang effect. It has a negative effect. Right. Yeah, so it does yeah. make a difference. So what are the best values for people to affirm? Well, it, yeah, the, the, I mean, the, the idea behind the alcohol one is that it's not an unrelated domain mm -hmm. uh, because alcohol, for most people, is a, a social behaviour, um, whereas most health threats, um, I, think, I think health health might not be one of the values that listed. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the idea has to be in a, an unrelated domain. Yeah. Right. Right. Could you say the thing about alcoholism and sociality again? If you had a value of uh, social relations, yes. how did that affect your alcoholism? Uh, your so, the, uh, yeah, so, this, so this would have been with students giving them information about the, the risks of alcohol. Um, so in the particular study, we, uh, we use this value, value essay approach. So people choose the most important value. So if, we, if you look at the people who chose, uh, I think, social relationships, then the eye, and it actually had a negative effect. Okay. What do you mean negative? So, it, what? so pe people were, were more defensive. Oh, I see. Yeah. I see. It yeah. wasn't self-affirming. No, yeah, it wasn't self. Well, it was self-affirming, but it w but our argument was that it was it's not in an unrelated domain, because for for most uh, students in particular, it's very much a social activity. So so drinking alcohol yeah, is, is a way of being sociable, and so if you're then affirming a, a value which is about sociability. It's, it's linked to the threat. Right, so it does, it's self-affirming, but it, it doesn't remove your defensiveness. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Anybody else? Thanks, Anna another way around the sort of self-defensiveness is, um, just to pick up a theme of the morning, is about um, how, you, how a person would advise another person. So w would a person uh, advise someone else to cut down their drinking in order to reduce their risk of breast cancer? And that might give you a better idea, yeah. or it might prove that they have a self-serving bias if they make a different um, statement about someone else versus themselves. 
So I think the whole, the, the problem with placing all of us, and especially health psychology, is that it relies so much on espoused beliefs, views, attitudes, and there isn't enough sort of deviousness <laughs> to get at implicit values mm. and uh, mm -hmm. uh, non-espoused beliefs. Mm. You know, to be as stealthy uh, in our in our sort of trying to reveal these these underlying beliefs as, as the beliefs are themselves sometimes. Yeah, I mean, one thing, another uh, technique which I've, um, which I've come across is um, inoculation theory. So, 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 uh, it's almost similar. So, you, you say to, you give people extreme statements and then you get them to try and argue for them. Um, and they're really, you know, really extreme. So you try to get them to develop a um, the argument for them, and the idea is that then inoculates them against a less, um, a kind of, I guess, a, against a less severe risk message. If that makes sense. I'm not sure I've explained it well, but, uh, but, but, but yes, you're right. It's another kind of slightly indirect technique to kind of get around the fact that um, people will have have a tendency to to react defensively to to threatening information. And, and also denial. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I did a study on, on presentation with breast cancer and delay, and reasons for <coughs> given for delay. And I think, uh, as has come out, there is uh, it's quite a complicated relationship between anxiety, worry, being something that promotes health-seeking behavior, then up to a point then yeah. it's just something you'd rather avoid. Yeah. And so people who were delaying were the most anxious people. Yeah. And also people with very extreme advanced breast cancer who hadn't presented to clinicians. And what they said about how did you ignore this terrible lesion? And the sort of explanations they gave were um, really banal and not at all plausible. Uh, so obviously there were some very heavy duty uh, psychological defense mechanisms being brought into play yeah. that you couldn't really take at face value. Yeah. Oh, I thought it would go away. I was just busy. Um, and, and really, that can't be true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just to follow up on that, I wonder whether um, the association between things like anxiety and worry and action might actually be very variable between individuals and whenever we do um, studies of predictors of behavior we're always looking at the mean the mean yeah. um, a across the whole sample and it might actually be that for some people worry is a great galvanizer into action and for other people it's the thing that makes you put your head in the sand and I think generally in, in all kinds of um, trials, interventions, we are not actually giving enough um, weight to the idea that there might be big individual differences in, in people's response to different elements within the, the um, whatever it is yeah. we're, we're studying. Yeah. I don't know if you agree. No, I absolutely agree. The, the challenge is to know what those individual differences are in advance. Um, I mean, one way around is, you know, is, is, is tailoring as much as possible. So you, so you can you, you, if you know, you know, from studies or meta-analyses what, uh, what variables are related on a kind of a population or mean level, then you know what individuals' beliefs are. Um, so you know then which ones need targeting. That's kind of gets, a, I mean, it's a halfway house to what you're suggesting. But ideally, you'd want to, you, you'd want to know about people's individual differences, um, in terms of you know um, the ability to deal with risk information or anxiety and so on, but it's, I think it's without knowing the person, so it's very difficult to develop a program in advance for these different people, and that's the challenge. There's, there's almost an infinite number of potential variables yeah. that you would need to. So, so um, I mean, perhaps it would be interesting to look at whether there is great variability just across your sample without trying to find out what the predictor is of your response to a particular element of the intervention or 
just to see whether there is a big variation. You know, do you get some people for whom this is predicting what in one direction, and some people for yeah. whom it's predicting in another yeah. direction without <coughs> trying to actually be able to predict? Yeah, and I'm not not aware of many studies that do that. Yeah, you know, some you get some kind of simple moderation analysis so for like you know gender or age yeah. or so on, but yeah, being able to look at yeah, it would be really interesting to look at people who the intervention, well, particularly if, if there are any negative effects, but what, what is it about those people that it, it clearly didn't work or had a negative effect versus those who did, yeah. I, I'm not aware of studies that have done that. But.